Oh, well, thanks for inviting me to speak at the International Symposium on Visual Computing. Uh, what I wanted to talk about today was just this idea of how we can use visualization to have fun in the data deluge. You know, we keep hearing about big data for over a decade now and thinking about how we can use this information to gain insight into data. You know, as of May 2019, YouTube users upload more than 500 hours of new video every minute of the day. You'll never be able to catch up. In 2009, drones from Iraq and Afghanistan recorded 24 years of video, video footage. Walmart processes $36 million an hour in sales transactions. You can go to the Library of Congress and download 74 terabytes of data freely. Um, and they have more than 235 terabytes of data collected and being processed. IBM is reporting that there will be 364,000 data science jobs open. So obviously, there is a ton of really interesting and exciting data out there and thinking about ways where we can use this. But oftentimes, people sort of think about this as um, shown in this Dilbert cartoon where Dogbert talks about how information is gushing towards your brain like a fire hose aimed at a tea teacup. And so we have this sort of apprehension about how can we use this <clears throat> massive amounts of data but I think instead of thinking this as sort of fire hose aimed at a teacup, I think we should think about how we can play in this sort of data deluge. How can we take advantage of this? And what are fun and interesting and exciting applications that we can do with this data? And then how can we translate them to forms that people can understand and explore and think about? So one obvious sort of data set that people may not think too much about are the white pages. The U.S. white pages have 778.4 uh, million phone name address pairs. So from the telephone book, I get your first name, your last name, your address. Um, from your address, I can link this to Zillow, so I can guess how much your house is worth. I can link this to the census data to guess what gender a name is, to guess how old a name is. Um, if I make some sort of interface where people can explore maps of this data, Who's more likely to explore a map of Ross Majeski? Well, probably somebody with the last name of Majeski, so I can start getting more information about potential connections to these people. And so what we did is we started thinking about, well, how can we make some sort of visual interface to explore the white pages? And thinking about really what's in a name. Uh, this is work that we did with Paul Longley out of the University College of London. And his research had demonstrated that people don't really move around that much. Names tend to stay in the same place aside from large migration waves. And so we can take uh, these names in the phone book and we can create these uh, nice interactive maps with them and link them to other sorts of things. So for example, in Romeo and Juliet's case, what if I want to know where all the Montagues in the U.S. live? I can put a query in, say, show me all the addresses for the Montagues, and I can make this nice heat map. And I can see Montague is sort of a North Carolina, Virginia sort of name. But I can also do a word cloud and show all the people who have names with a similar spatial distribution. The darker red and the bigger the name, and the more similar the spatial distribution. So Montagues live by Wilsons and Petets, Stocks and Simmons. Um, we could do this for Capulets too, but there's less than 100 Capulets in our U.S. White Pages database. Now, of course, you may say, well, Ross, the White Pages are going the way of the dodo. That's probably true. Most people have cell phones now. Um, white pages are a little bit different, but this is still just a fun data source we can think about how to play with, and it gives us a snapshot in time of the U.S. We can do things like map Majeski land, and we can see the Polish belt in the United States. Uh, for those of you that don't know, Chicago is the largest Polish population city in the world. If you're familiar with um, Polish names, you'll see this sort of belt through Michigan, Ohio, <clears throat> New York to New York City, and like I said, we can map this to uh, census data or to Zillow and start guessing how much money a person with the last name Majeski might have. We can even create some sort of visualization for this. We don't have to just stick with last names, <clears throat> but if we do, we can start looking for immigration patterns across the world and start drawing these. If we know the origin of Majeski land and we know where people in the U.S. have searched for Majeski from our app, we can start seeing this potential um, migration pathways in the U.S. And it turns out some of these match really well to people's mental models. We don't have to just stick with last names, though. We can also do first names. So where are people named Ross in the U.S.? And here we can sort of see around Salt Lake City, Ross is a 
popular name. Maybe it's a common Mormon name. We see this sort of on the um, eastern side of the U.S., from Chicago to New York, um, uh, places in northern Georgia and Florida, um, as well as sort of the Kansas City area of Missouri. I am not from any of those places. I'm from sort of <clears throat> this uh, eastern side of Missouri. We can also start looking at guessing the age distribution of people named Ross. And so we can look at this sort of peak and we see um, around the mid-1980s, the name Ross uh, was sort of trending at its highest popularity. We can see a secondary peak in the mid-90s, maybe associated to friends. Uh, growing up, you'd be surprised in the mid-90s when people would say, oh, Ross, were you named after friends? Yes, um, at the age of 18, you're right, my mom was pretty sentient and saw this TV show and named me after this, so um, we can sort of start guessing how old I might be. My mom was ahead of the trend. I was born in 1979. You see, that was sort of an uptick of the rise in popularity of Rosses. You wouldn't be too terribly far off if you guessed at one of these peaks. <clears throat> now, this is just one example of where visualization can be used to help us think about and have fun with data. If I were just to give you the whole stack of white pages with and names and addresses, it's not really that useful. But once we map these, create these heat maps, link these to secondary data sources, we can start talking about interesting trends within data. Other common data sources people like to use are Twitter. But with Twitter data, I think it's fun to think about what are interesting questions we might be able to ask on Twitter. And one of these could just be, well, what if we just look for things like food preferences via Twitter? Um, what if we're just interested in how people talk about dairy across the U.S., for example. So dairy gets an interesting sort of um, reputation in the U.S., let's say. So you'll read articles about nutrition. Dairy is good for you. Dairy is bad for you. You need calcium. Whole milk can have issues with too much fat. And so there's all these conflicting informations. And everybody thinks you're an expert in nutrition. Nutrition is a STEM major, by the way, where you heard metabolic pathways, um, absorption of nutrients, and these sorts of things. But if you go online, you'll see all of these different blogs talking about what diet you should have, what to consume. And so we just thought it might be fun to think about, what if we just mine all the tweets in the U.S. for a few months, um, picking keywords related to dairy. So we can have dairy, cheese, milk, yogurt, kefir, um, and so any tweet that has that, we can grab, and then for the ones that are geolocated, <clears throat> we can put them on a map in the U.S. And so here, in my upper left map, this is just the, um, where people are talking about um, the word dairy. We can normalize by population, so we can also start maybe getting an idea of what states um, are the dairy belt in the U.S. even. And on the right, we can get a sentiment of the topic as well. So we can see that in general, people are pretty positive about dairy. Blue is very positive. And red to pink is very negative. So we might start asking, well, why are we seeing states in New England having negative sentiment about dairy? And then we can also see, well, what word most commonly comes after dairy in these tweets? So we can see that, well, we get dairy and clean. Not surprising. But also dairy farm, <coughs> dairy free, dairy farmers, dairy products, dairy bar. Um, and here you can see sort of just a word cloud making up the big words related to dairy. So we get dairy clean, ice, blizzard. This sort of gives us a quick overview of different things that people are talking about with respect to dairy in the United States. Um, and then we can start thinking about, well, what about the word milk? What goes along with milk? And so some of the common, most common words are chocolate milk, almond milk, <coughs> cereal milk, strawberry milk, Oreo milk, milk tea, milkshake. And it's interesting. So we can look and see... Milk tea is not very popular, except in the state of California. Uh, we can see in the state of Wyoming, we don't really have anybody talking about milkshakes, whereas <clears throat> other states in the U.S. quite like milkshakes, aside from we also see this in uh, Nebraska. And so it makes you wonder if maybe there's a regional dialogue difference where they don't talk about shakes. And you can explore this more in terms of dairy. We talked about two of the popular words after dairy were clean, and farmers. And so we can see how many tweets talk about dairy queen and dairy farmers. So we see North Dakota, huge dairy queen state. Ohio, talking about dairy queen and dairy farmers. But interestingly enough, Vermont is the only state that doesn't talk about dairy queen. And we can Google this and we can see from secondary information that Vermont is the only state without a dairy queen. 
Uh, they're planning for expansions in 2016. I have no idea if they ever did. This was um, what I found when I Googled this. But again, what's fun about this is if I just grab all the tweets about dairy, that's fine. But how do I help people explore and understand this? And this is where thinking about how we can convert data to visual representations that people can interact with um, and can help us gain insight and knowledge. And again, helping us ask interesting and fun questions. There's so many data sources out there, but thinking about how to link those together. I mean, imagine once I know that Vermont doesn't talk about dairy clean, I can quickly go and ask Google about this. I could search Wikipedia. I could link this to data on Reddit. Um, all sorts of fun um, things that we could be creating to explore and try to understand what's going on. And we can even start thinking about, well, how can we use some of these sources for prediction and analysis? Can I get business information from Twitter? And so in 2013, there was a fun contest in the visual analytics community um, using Twitter and IMDb to predict how much money the box office is going to make in a given weekend. Now, of course, since COVID-19 hit, the concept of sort of box office predictions may be out the window, but I think this is another fun example of having fun in the data deluge, taking these different data sources, combining them together, and seeing if we can forecast how much money a particular movie is going to make. And what's nice is this task can relate to all sorts of interesting challenges for companies that want to look at their social media presence, see how marketing campaigns are going. And so our goal was, given a set of data from um, IMDb, which is the International Movie Database, a set of Twitter indices that contain tweets about particular box office movies, and a set of bit.ly links that contain um, some reviews and ratings of the movie, can we predict? the opening weekend gross of a movie, as well as the viewer rating. What's the overall score out of 10? You know, is this going to be a 9 out of 10 movie, a 2 out of 10 movie? And can that information help inform us and build these forecasts? <clears throat> and so for the data collection, we were given tweets for a two-week period prior to the release date based off the hashtag provided by a movie's official Twitter account. And then we also scraped bit.ly containing movie keywords. All this data was given to you in a dump every week from the past contest. And we were limited in our words to only be able to use these um, particular metrics from Twitter and IMDb. Some of these we could self-create, like sentiment analysis. Some of these were from IMDb directly, but no other information was allowed in this contest. So we didn't have things like the number of open screens um, and that sort of information can help you build a very strong predictive model. So we were sort of limited there. So we would mine for Twitter sentiment to sort of get an idea of what's um, being talked about positively, negatively. Uh, but there's challenges in Twitter. Data is very noisy. The length of tweets is only 270 characters. So what people talk about how these sentiment mining tools might work becomes a little bit challenging. So we can think about how we can use visualization to help clean up and interact with some deep machine learning models as well, too. So we can create um, what we call the Tweet Sentiment Visualization Tool, where the y-axis was the number of users, I'm sorry, let me start over. So each dot here is a tweet. The y-axis is the number of users following that tweet. The x-axis is the date when a tweet was posted. And the size of the circle is how many times that tweet was retweeted. And the color was the general sentiment. Now the problem is, for some movies, um, since we're calculating sentiment based sort of on word scores, the names of the movies make the movie sound negative as it is. If you have a movie like Despicable Me, Despicable is a negative sentiment word. And so we might want to be able to adjust our machine learning model. Um, you can also click on things that are retweeted. You can see, I don't even know what this sort of uh, text is about. We have a bunch of uh, gibberish and then 3D eye popping bang it different language, so again, translation sentiment becomes difficult. Or we might see things like, I want to see this so bad, but bad is given a negative sentiment score, but actually we can all agree this tweet is positive. So we can allow the user to go in and relabel some of these tweets to do some semi-supervised learning and update the model interactively. And so this is where visualization can combine with machine learning and start thinking about how we might have an interesting and exciting way to explore data and we can go in and allow people to modify this sentiment. So here is just our tool. They can go and pick and relabel these. And as they relabel, we can retrain the um, sentiment model in the background. 
Now, part of the challenge is that each movie may have different things that need retraining. So other interesting aspects that our group has been working on is how can we perform transfer learning and things like that. And of course, we can do other visualizations as well. We can look at the Tweet Sediment uh, River, for example. So we can look at um, sort of the number of positive sediments and the number of negative sediments and show this sort of um, two peaks here. So we can do like a ratio of positive sediment over positive and negative. If you wonder why we have this dip here around Thursday, the data collection was broken on that day when it was given to us, so we weren't able to collect data then. Part of this was just also seeing how we could go about in our real-world scenario. If you don't necessarily have a continuous data stream of things break, how will you be able to adjust your forecast to this? So here we have a sediment river where sediment is aggregated over four-hour intervals. Positive sediment is plotted in blue above the x-axis, negative is in red below. And the user can select an area on the river to see the ratio of positive to negative sediment. And we can also do a sediment wordle, where the size of the word represents the number of times that we've used um, in our tweets. Color represents the sentiment. And again, we could select different words and say, hey, no, this word should not be a negative sentiment in our tool, in our model for this time. So for example, again, back to the stick we'll meet. Um, we can also look at tweets by volume and see what users, and who is talking about this. Is it driven by um, particular users? Is it driven by the movie's um, own advertising company? And we can start creating our different models of the data. And so we just stuck with a relatively simple regression model for this. Our response is going to be the opening weekend gross. And what we did is we um, ran a whole bunch of different um, regression modeling tools, and we found that the best model was the simplest. We just used um, budget and the average daily number of tweets, <coughs> and that gave us sort of this nice opening weekend gross as a function of those two variables. Now the problem was, <coughs> that the R squared of this is not very good. Sort of 0.6, it's significant, but this gives us a starting point, but we know it doesn't match very well. So what we did is we wanted to add the user into the loop here to start thinking about how we might adjust the daily forecasts. And so for each movie, uh, we have the prediction and the range for the prediction. We have a, uh, we were then asked to submit a response, how much money was that movie going to make? And then we could also show, once the data was given, how much money that movie did make. This allows us to compare sort of these forecasts between different movies and how we were doing, and sort of track this and allow this exploration. So we could create this sort of comparison view, or we could look at the um, comparison between movies on a variety of different structures. So if we're trying to predict this bit, well, me too, here we don't have a prediction yet. Here we haven't submitted our forecast yet, and we don't know the real gross. We can start looking at other movies like White House Down or Fast and Furious 6, or the um, ones that are going to be coming out. And we can find and compare the accuracy of those predictions on this type of genre. And we can see that they underestimated, overestimated, were they relatively accurate with regards to similar movies. And this allows us to explore temporal and sentiment similarity with regards to social media trends. We can look at their and different word clouds and their different um, sentiment rivers and start trying to reason about, well, how do we think the model is going to perform in this case? We can look at the overall final review score of a movie, and as we look at that, do we think that will drive more traffic? Do we think we'll get a higher opening weekend gross? And so for the movie review prediction, we also took average score from Bitly. So we had all of these different um, reviews from Bitly from different users, and we could just do things like take the average score. And so it came to sort of the July 3rd weekend of that year, and we were asked to do a movie score prediction for Despicable Me 2 and The Lone Ranger. Those were the two movies being released. And so, like I said, we were looking to see what other movies might we compare Despicable Me 2 um, to as well. And here we see that if we look at just MPAA rating of recent movies, Epic, The Crudes, and Oz, The Great and Powerful, had similar MPAA ratings. We can see sort of how their tweets went, but remember, some of our tweets from Despicable Me 2 um, were lost due to um, issues in data collection, or we just didn't have the data yet. We were a couple days <clears throat> ahead of the movie being released, and so we wanted to compare. And so we could see that for Epic, the real gross and the prediction were pretty close. We submitted that it would underperform, um, but we were wrong there. 
And so we wanted to start thinking about, well, what else? And another common movie um, that's a sequel to a hit um, animated movie that came out this summer was Monsters University. And we can see our prediction was quite low. Um, and actually that we're seeing this overperform even if we took the upper bound of our prediction range. And so we started thinking, well, maybe this could be me too, has very similar characteristics to Monster University in that sense. And so maybe we can adjust the different scores. <clears throat> and like I said, one challenge was the data stream is broken. Only six days worth of tweets were provided. And then this will also want to be released on a holiday, and the prediction needs to then match a five-day long weekend, where most of the data we were predicting over was three days long. So from our um, movie office <coughs> gross prediction uh, tool using our linear regression model, it estimated that the Lone Ranger should make 85 million plus or minus 13, and the Spickle Me Too should make 76 million plus or minus 13 over three days. But if we look at Oz and Monsters <laughs> University, those tend to be at the higher end range of the scale. So we said, well, maybe Despicable Me Too should be adjusted upward. But if we compare Lone Ranger with um, another copy like World War Z, the three day between weekend was less than 66 million. So it seems this prediction was way too high. So we estimated this would probably even be less than 66 million if we're looking at World War Z. Furthermore, if we look at the, in the um, tweets, we're seeing that Despicable Me 2 is having many, many more positive tweets than Lone Ranger. And so from our sort of mental model, we also thought, well, how much money might be in the market that weekend? Maybe over three days, maybe there's only $121 million of movies being sold. We can sort of make a linear guess of how much money is in the market. And so then we need to sort of split that up. If we say, okay, there's only $121 million in the market, and we think the Spickle Me 2 is going to make 82, then there's only about 39 million left for the Lone Ranger. And then we just did a linear interpolation for our five day opening weekend. So, how did we do? These were our predictions. We predicted 82 million in three days, 117 million, 39 million, and 55 million. Well, um, the actual value over three days for the Spickle Me 2 was 83.5 million. And over five days, it really. Um, expanded much higher than we expected. Now the Lone Ranger, we were higher than expected for three days. It only made 29 million. But overall, we were not too terribly far off. And in our viewer rating prediction, relatively close as well too. And our metrics, we used average error in terms of millions of dollars, standard deviation from the average error, mean relative absolute error. And we could compare. There were a whole bunch of other teams that competed um, from Vader, Team Prolix, Constance, Cinema, uh, Viz, um, and so we can sort of look at how many times they put in an entry, uh, what their average error was, what their standard deviation. And what we see is that overall, um, using our sort of system and ideas that we had, we were quite good compared to other teams. Our average error was the lowest average error, and we had a pretty tight standard deviation. So you might ask, well, how did we do compared with other professional predictions? And that's interesting too. So compared to professional places like boxoffice.com or filmgo.net, we were a little bit higher, but not too bad compared to filmgo.net. We were uh, slightly better than them. We had a higher standard deviation and a higher um, MRAE, but it's interesting. Once we added in interaction and people into the loop to start thinking and reasoning about this not actually very good model with an R squared of 0.6, we could improve performance, where if we just used the model by itself and didn't take into account any human considerations, we would have been way off. So again, thinking about how we can take interesting data sources, combine a user in the loop, and create these sort of forecasts and predictions can be really exciting. And here you can sort of see how we did over time. Our prediction that we submitted was the red line here. And you can see overall we were pretty well aligned with our um, competitors in the um, expert arena from boxoffice.com, FilmGo, Hollywood Stock Exchange. Uh, one that we did really bad on was After Earth. This was a Will Smith uh, sort of piece uh, that my students at the time, they really liked Will Smith and were confident that his movie would do well. It did not. Um, other ones, uh, The Heat was a difficult one to predict. You can see we were a little bit outside the range there. This movie was released at the same time as the Miami Heat were going to the NBA playoffs, and so hashtag the Heat 
It was a very confusing hashtag during that weekend. And so again, these are just sort of, if we remove that particularly really bad um, week from our uh, records, our average error um, improves quite a bit from 0.285 to 0.239. And so our takeaways from the vast box office challenge is that social media data is extremely noisy. Um, due to ever-changing stream of social media sources and users, it's critical to link the human into the loop. And linking multiple data sources with varying levels of reliability can enhance the predictive abilities of a system. And we want to be able to create these tools that can quickly enable a novice analysts to close the gap between experts. And so we're able to take these fun data sources and start thinking about how we can use them in more practical settings. And in fact, even thinking about uh, social media data for predictions, um, iHarpa was thinking about how can we do these uh, forecasts and have a contest on super forecasters and things like this. So there's lots of interesting sorts of things we might do with social media data, not just looking at box office challenges or where do people talk about dairy, but doing something critical. And we've had, ex um, we've had applications in emergency response, and we're seeing how people can use these to sort of guide first responders to where people are talking about things in crisis. And then there are other data sources that can be used during crisis management. In fact, one major data source comes from large-scale scientific computing for modeling and simulation. For example, the Blossom model is a bathymetry and ambient blowout parameter model <coughs> that's used to track uh, flows of particles. So for example, if you have an oil blowout spill, you can use this to model based on <clears throat> uh, water currents, wind, etc., where oil particles are going to go. Now, while that shows us how the flow of oil will occur in the ocean, what we also are interested in is things like <clears throat> um, surrounding communities. What are economic points of interest? What are their access to uh, boat ramps that can be used to provide cleaning resources? What are their funds <clears throat> in terms of monetary amount they can use to spend for cleanup. And so we can create different visual analytics tools that can take these models and simulations, combine them with external data sources to create some sort of dispatch plan for decision making and planning. And so here we provide a visual design of parcel overview, a temporal overview of how the oil spill will occur, and then a visual comparison of the different potential decision making portfolios. <clears throat> so here's a nice video showing our system. The different colors of dots here represent the types of particles, whether they're um, underwater, whether they're surfaced. We can uh, create some sort of outline of the general spill to give an idea of where cleanup crews may need to go. And we can show what happens if we dispatch boats on different days, what percentage of different types of particles are cleaned up, which cluster <coughs> a particular boat may be sent to, and how much money we can invest. What if we're only trying to achieve a 75% cleanup versus a 90% cleanup? How do we that compare to if we do nothing at all? Um, all these are really important, and let alone thinking about what communities and economies are impacted becomes critical. Now, along with doing models and simulations, there's other proprietary data sources as well, too. So for example, there's things called syndromic surveillance, which is the detection of adverse health events focusing on pre-diagnosis information. This could be over-the-counter sales medicine, news reports on emerging diseases, or emergency department chief complaints. So previous work um, I have done was on Indiana's <clears throat> public health emergency surveillance system. At the time, this consisted of 77 emergency departments, um, about 7,000 visits per day, <coughs> and they broke each of these visits into a syndromic category, whether it was respiratory, gastrointestinal, neurological, etc. And so again, we can create these nice different maps of patients with different types of illnesses, allow our decision makers to explore trends, let's say gastrointestinal illness over time. Um, here we can see if we select a region of the map that has a hotspot, we can look at the time series and see if there might be an alert issued that day. If an alert is issued, maybe we want to look at the neighboring hospital to see if it's experiencing similar trends. In this case, we don't see a similar trend in that neighboring hospital. We could drill down on particular keywords then, looking at fever, and we can see maybe um, there's just a sparse count of people with fever and gastrointestinal illness. This sparse count causes anomalies in the time series detection, and so it may be that we want to go ahead and ignore this. But these decision-making um, tools, interactive visualization, 
allow us to quickly explore, drill down, filter, and <clears throat> reason about what's going on behind these different algorithms. We can even do this for law enforcement data too. And much law enforcement data is now publicly available through different portals. So for example, Chicago has a very nice portal for law enforcement data. Here we design what we call Ballet, the Visual Analytics Law Enforcement Technology Toolkit that was developed in partnership with Purdue and the Department of Homeland Security to ingest geolocated criminal incident reports. Um, and one question that the Purdue police officers had was, well, what's the relationship between drunkenness and public intoxication to uh, football games? It's not that they didn't think there was any relationship. They were just more curious on um, fun questions. Again, thinking about fun in the day of the week. If you have home games or away games, if you win or lose, does it have any impacts on this? And so some interesting trends we can see right away. If we look at the time of day when drunkenness and public intoxication arrests occur, we see they occur from midnight to about 3 a.m. And if I look at a day of the week distribution, I see I have a whole bunch on Sunday. But if we think about this, that probably doesn't make sense. If I define the day from midnight to 11.59 p.m. the next evening, these arrests probably would and then wind up being on Sunday. But really, we might classify this as sort of Saturday night. So again, thinking about how we define our analytical boundaries is critical. So, but now back to the question on public intoxication and home games. Here I've made a time series of public intoxication arrests. Each dot that's filled in is a home game. Each open circle is an away game. So we can see in general that the away games don't have nearly as much public intoxication arrests. And the low, <coughs> filled in red dots are actually times when students are away. So the bottom line here is basically if students are away and during a football game, there's lower amounts of public intoxication, at least on campus here. Uh, we can look at wins and losses. Purdue lost to Notre Dame. Here, Purdue had homecoming. They won versus Illinois. And here, they lost to Iowa. So win or lose, we still had relatively big spikes in these um, local sort of home games. And again, this just goes back to sort of interesting questions that people might want to ask about different data sources and thinking about how we can build different visuals to support this and what interactions might go about in helping them create <clears throat> these different decision-making processes. Now I want to shift a little bit to another really fun and exciting data source. And this is work done um, and led by my colleague, um, Ariana Medell. So the work I'm going to talk about, I work on it with her, but um, all credit to her, this is really her um, fun and interesting idea on how to take some unique big data and apply this for cool applications in um, uh, urban planning. And so urban climate informatics is looking at urban form, composition, design, a green infrastructure um, that can impact urban climate. So we have the formation of urban heat islands, uh, local microclimate, we have energy use of buildings and pedestrian heat stress. These are hard things to measure. Uh, it's hard to collect all of these different data sets to get these local microclimate uh, things for simulation. We have a lack of this fine scale data to describe the form and functions of cities. What if we want to do climate modeling for a very local community or modeling for municipalities? So the question that um, Ariana and I started playing with was how can urban form and function be described from a human centric perspective? How can we do this at the street level? And how can we do this for cities all around the world? And the cool thing is that um, Google Earth and Google Street View has been collecting images of all of the urban form at massive cities. Google Earth virtual camera tour along a predefined path. You have five meters of spatial resolution. You have a camera height of 1.1 meters, a view angle of 90 degrees. You have screenshots in each cardinal direction. So you're having all this information about urban farm in these pictures. And now, as computer vision has improved so much, you can start using computer vision techniques to extract different features of urban form. And now, of course, we're not necessarily the first people to think about how we can leverage um, Google satellite imagery, Google street view imagery for things. Google itself has their project Sunroof, where you can go and, um, from satellite imagery, get a customized savings estimates for solar savings that are calculated based on your roof size and shape and shaded roof area, local weather, local electric prices. So you can go in and sort of <clears throat> see how much money you might save by installing um, solar panels. Another cool application using satellite imagery was looking at tax evasion. So um, 
in Greece, tax authorities were surveying the returns of 150 doctors. They had offices in very trendy acting neighborhood of Kolonaki. These are where Prada and Chanel stores are. But they were claiming very low incomes, less than $40,000 a year. And even 34 of them claimed less than $13,000 a year, which means they wouldn't pay any taxes. And so they started thinking about, well, why don't I just look at their houses in a satellite and see if that even makes sense? And so they'd pull this up and they'd see these swanky houses in these pools. And from there, they could start even estimating energy use calculations and these things. So they could say, there is no way you're able to afford this home on this sort of salary. And so starting to do more um, tax monitoring for fraud and so using this. And so in our application, we wanted to think about, well, what else could we use these Google Street View images and Google Earth views for? And Ariana started thinking about, well, one common factor that you need for these microclimate simulations is how much sky is in an area. So if we can take these five column directions, put them into a hemispherical projection, and then do computer vision for sky detection so we can classify each pixel in this image as sky or non-sky, then we can estimate what's called a sky view factor. And this is the fraction of vis visible sky viewed from the ground up, the value between 0 and 1. It's commonly used uh, by urban climatologists to quantify the openness of an urban site, so you have these sort of urban canyons, or you're wide open, and this influences the amount of incoming and outgoing solar and terrestrial radiation. So if you have a low sky view factor, you get reduced long wave radiation loss at night and reduced short wave gain during the day. And then um, Dr. Minnell has this cart called Marty, which she can drive around and actually measure all of these things. Now, of course, that's not very scalable. So she does this to test and see whether or not the things we're estimating from Google Street View match up with physical uh, measures in the world. And it turns out it's not too bad. So here's just a high resolution sky view map for Phoenix, Arizona. So <clears throat> the brighter the red, the less sky that's visible, uh, the darker the blue, the more sky that's visible. So here you can sort of see the urban sprawl of Phoenix. The downtown corridor here where you have some of the large buildings sort of creating some of these urban canyons. And if you go further afield into places like Ahwatukee, um, which is a suburb in Phoenix, you can see the low head buildings, not many tree coverage. <clears throat> so we can see um, quite a lot of open sky. And so what's interesting is thinking about how we can take a data source that's already been collected and not necessarily collected for this purpose and leverage this for new and interesting and exciting sorts of data analytics. And then from this, she could start um, taking information about sky view factor and doing things like human radiation balance or mean radiant temperature. So mean radiant temperature is the measure of the average temperature of the surface that surrounds a person. So now since we have this high resolution data, we know the time of the day, we can figure out the angle of the sun, um, we can calculate these things from these fisheye photos that we have captured from Google Street View. And so I think this is really interesting for <clears throat> this symposium on visual computing. You know, we're thinking about how can we combine uh, geometry, computer vision, and now apply this to do some of this sort of ideas of urban planning. And let alone, we can start thinking about this for um, fun applications of urban planning. What about my daily walk? Phoenix is hot. So if I want to walk from my office in the Brickyard to the Memorial Union, which is um, most campuses have unions, right? That's where maybe restaurants or cafes or classes are. So I might have to walk there every day. Um, here you can see we have sort of a giant parking lot. So I can sort of cut across here and we can start doing what is the shortest path to get to the MU. Uh, most of it is sort of Manhattan distance. I can't cut across things. I could consider cutting through buildings, but let's just pretend that it's not allowed. Some buildings are locked down. So given the time of day, I can start thinking about, well, which way should I walk? We're creatures of habits. We tend to always walk the same path no matter what time of day it is. But if I were to tell you, hey, you know, if you take a slightly different path, it'll cost you five extra seconds, but you'll be in a lot more shade, that may be sort of an ideal situation. Let alone, now if we have information about different paths that students are walking and what are the most common paths on particular times of day, we can start combining these together to start thinking about where should we add more shade? How should we organize different resources around campus? How can we better improve sort of the thermal comfort of 
um, students in this urban environment. And I think that's really fun and exciting. And these are things that we can do with this data set that wasn't necessarily intended for this. And now think about this as well. If I have the class schedules of students, that's not necessarily intended for urban planning either. But combining these together, I can start thinking about how we might be able to do better campus planning, better pedestrian routing based on thermal comfort preferences. And I think what's great about all this is by visualizing this data, we're able to convert data into insight. And visual analytics uses advanced analytical algorithms combined with interactive visual interfaces where the user can explore the data analyses. And I've shown this example in um, our sort of name profiler where you can explore how much your name is worth, how old a person might be, who else might have grown up in a similar spatial region to you. Um, and then we showed how this can even allow for the combination of the domain expert knowledge. So if we had our forecasting facts, for example, and users can start reasoning about uh, similar movies and similar forecasts or different forecasts and trying to combine this knowledge to um, sort of reason about what an upcoming decision might be, let alone taking other data sources and just thinking about how we might process these using visual computing techniques and geometry to apply these to different sorts of circumstances. And so I think there's lots of fun in the data deluge, but there's also lots of long-term fundamental challenges that we need to address. And there was this great quote about how this data needs to be fused with relevant contextual or situational information and visualized to give our forces a clear picture of threats, options, and potential consequences. And while this is very DOD-centric, I think this first part about how can we fuse big data together to ask interesting questions is a lot of fun. Again, think about the name profiler. By itself, the white pages are interesting. You see some cool maps. But once we link that to Zillow and start guessing income, once we link that to age, once we link that to gender, we can start guessing a lot about a person's name. And it's not uncommon for you just to tell me your name, right? If I say, hi, I'm Ross, I say, hi, hi, I'm Bill. No problem. Um, thinking about how we can link <clears throat> this urban climate data together, taking Google Street View imagery, linking it with other measures of pedestrian access. Lots of fun and interesting things we can do, taking this multi-source cross-media analysis, taking uncertainty in the data like we had with the Twitter data, um, taking different scales of data. How can we do this sort of numerical to visual analysis? And so there's lots of fun other applications we can think about, like walkability assessment from all these Google images. Can I get a walk score analysis? Are there, is there a sidewalk in the area? Um, what's the offset from the road? Are there crosswalks? What if I have active solar access management? Should I do targeted tree planting or shade, shade structure installation? Uh, what about transit assessment, bikeability, or heat warning systems during marathons or pedestrian routing during extreme heat? And these are just ones to think about from our sort of urban informatics perspective. What I want to encourage people today hearing this talk and thinking about all these applications of um, vision is what cool data sets are out there, but also what cool questions do you have? What are questions that people are asking and what proxies might be there in the data? We've seen this already where uh, for years now people have been using satellite imagery of city lights to estimate population and to estimate even things like uh, wealth inequality and income. Those are great proxies. What other data sources might we think about that we can get information like this from? And so I'd be remiss, I need to say, this material is based upon a lot of work supported by the U.S. Department of Homeland Security. The views and conclusions contained here are not those of the author and don't interpret these as representing any official policies. Um, so I just, again, want to really encourage people to think about how they might ask fun and interesting questions of these sorts of data sources that are unique. And by asking unique questions and teaming with different people from different domains, you can really do some fun things. So please feel free to check out our resource at, um, research at our lab or the visual analytics and data exploration research. I couldn't have done this without all of my students, and I'm happy to take questions at this point in time.